All right, so it should be no secret that Nostalgia Critic is a god-awful critic. If you don't know who Nostalgia Critic is, consider yourself very lucky. He's a man-child with a strangely small following for somebody who's been active on YouTube for over a decade and a half, but still considers himself enough of a micro-celebrity to do large fan meetups at conventions. Aye, aye, aye. His claim to fame? Being the funny and supposedly critiquing films. Now, this is not a video dedicated to hating on Nostalgia Critic. No, this is a video dedicated to hating on Nostalgia Critic for his terrible film takes. Because yeah, his content is some of the most vapid and mindless material that can be found online. Now, as somebody with some of the greatest and most successful content online, I feel that it is my civic duty as a denizen of the internet to wage war against the evil and corrupt Douglas Walker of the dreaded Empire of Chicago. So yeah, let's start this train wreck of a video series. This will be part one of a three-part series, so I ask that you subscribe if you want to see the next two parts. And, a quick word of warning, there'll be some strong language used in this video, so if you're not comfortable with that, this might not be the video for you. For one, what an awful intro. What kind of jackass starts his videos with a shitty CGI intro designed to knock off the visuals of film? Oh, well, fuck me, I guess. Oh god, a white guy! Oh wait, this is our main character, the Nostalgia Critic, played by Doug Walker. Yeah, his videos tend to start with these god-awful intro skits with terrible green screen and cringy-ass writing. Oh, fuck off. What was seen as a half-baked idea, literally laughed at by audiences just from the poster and teaser, turned into one of Disney's biggest franchises. With five films in the lineup, one good and the others there. Alright, so this is the reason I wanted to make this video series. The slander against Dead Man's Chest and At World's End. Simply put, they're good films. The objective quality of a well-crafted film is rooted in the consistency of characters and narrative, logical progression of said characters and narrative, and the lack of contrivances, contradictions, or plot holes. Simply put, if you have a story about a man sitting in a chair, that would technically be a perfect film, since the plot would be that of a man sitting in a chair. Would that be an enjoyable film? Most would say no. But that would be rooted in personal enjoyment, which is the definition of subjective. Can a film be bad because it's boring? Fuck no! Can a film be bad because it has contradictions in the narrative? Yes. Screenwriting is the art of conveying information through fictional worlds and characters, and if the information is self-contradicting without justification or intention of such, then you have a poor piece of storytelling. Everything else in a film is supposed to support the story, as the first thing that would traditionally be completed with a film is the story, or at least a rough outline. The cinematography and editing are how we see the film, and the music and sound design are how we hear it, and the acting is how we see and hear the characters fully realized on screen. I would not praise a terribly written film on the basis of, it looks pretty, because that would simply be saying, well I like the pretty colors, and other superfluous shit. That is antithetical to objective analysis, since that cannot be quantified. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Storytelling, however, is entirely something that can be universal. The flow of logic is not bound to personal emotion. It exists in the same way that 2 plus 2 equals 4. It is an objective fact. If a character acts a way that they were not in accordance to their character, that is a flaw. If the world building has contradictions that impact the narrative, that is a flaw. If the ability of the characters are inconsistent, that is a flaw. To what degree? Hard to say. And it is a case-by-case -case basis. Personally, I find number scores to be hard to pull off with true objective analysis, but I usually use them as a rough estimate as to what I truly think the overall quality is, taking into account the factual issues with the story. So, with all that being said, the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy is fucking great, and Doug's criticisms are entirely rooted in subjectivity, created from a lack of understanding of these children's films, or actively dishonest and manipulating scenes for the sake of being right. Alright, so I'm just going to skip the bullshit live action segment, since it's painfully unfunny and there's no reason to exist beyond that. It's all about me, mate. Drink up, me hotties, your house! Also, good god the royalty-free music hurts. Now I get it, you don't want to use the copyrighted music because you don't want to claim on your video. Which can hurt your revenue. I completely understand that, but good god could you find something better than the generic action number 16 on Adobe stock? Could you not use video game music or covers of the songs like all YouTubers do these days? This is only a teaser for how bad his videos are. I'm gonna skip the rest of the shitty intro because again, it adds nothing.
We open with a ship sailing the sea when a crewman named Gibbs, played by the underrated Kevin McNally, tells a young Elizabeth Swan not to sing about pirates. Bad luck to be singing about pirates. It's bad luck to have a woman on board too, even a miniature one. I remember that line being less eerie. Yeah, didn't you know? Sailors are superstitious. Need more context for your pea brain? She's with her father, Governor Swan, played by Jonathan Price. And I should point out this film has a weird way of calling back to other Disney films. Callbacks are everywhere in Disney flicks, and they're usually very clever because they work in some humor. But these are just... there. Why are you bringing this up? Aren't you the nostalgia critic? The person who looks at nostalgic properties and critiques them? Since when were you fast past facts? For example, he's dressed as Captain Hook. Why? Uh... Yeah, he wears a red coat and has a big hat and has a black wig. Does he know that's how sailors dressed at the time? Does he see people who wear business casual outfits and think, yeah, he looks like Dwight Schrute. Like, I could see that if he had a mustache and a massive chin and a different hat with the dead giveaway being having a hook hand, but he just wears an outfit that is vaguely reminiscent of Captain Hook. Ladies and gentlemen, criticism. Barbosa offers an apple that Elizabeth thinks is poisoned. Sure. Yeah, she's being offered food by a crazy old man. Yeah, she has reason for believing it's poisoned. And look, this guy said Little Mermaid! A Little Mermaid flopped up on deck and told him the whole story. Yeah, they're more distracting than funny. Little Mermaid? Really? He's mocking her for freaking out over cursed pirates. Now the Kraken spat out a mermaid skeleton with red hair? That would be hilarious. I laughed so hard. Moving on. Look! A boy! There's a boy in the water! Elizabeth sees a boy in the water and alerts the crew. Is it a Viggo Mortensen? No, it's an Orlando Blue. Ugh, throw him back. Uh, yes, he's played by Orlando Bloom as an adult. I fail to see your point. Pirates. <laughs> There's no proof of that. It's probably an accident. Yeah, it was probably the wind. It's always the wind. The wind set the ship on fire. <sighs> yes, a merchant ship has lots of powder kegs, as Norrington says. It's most likely the powder magazine. Merchant vessels run heavily armed. A lot of good it did them. Everyone's thinking it, I'm just saying it. Pirates. <laughs> There's no proof of that. It is probably an accident. You guys see what I mean by manipulating scenes? He'll ignore crucial information for the sake of jokes and being right. But all this does is spread misinformation. We're then introduced to Jack Sparrow, played by Johnny Depp, in what many have called one of the greatest character intros of all time. Finally, a valid point. The scene rocks. Depp worked hard at getting the look and actions of this character down, but sometimes a little too hard. While most people know he heard that pirates were the rock stars of their day, so he played them like Keith Richards, many don't know that while Verbinski said yes to almost all of Depp's costume choices, he drew the line at an artificial nose that would fall off every single time he sneezed. Yeah, I think something was definitely going on with Depp's nose when he recommended that. Uh, why is this relevant? Okay. What? Can you make a funny joke? These are his, sir. Uh... A compass that doesn't point north. No, no, it only points to what your heart wants. Or whatever bullshit we make up in the next one pretending we had these planned all along. All right, so here is finally a point that he thinks is criticism, but it's actually bullshit. <laughs> it's really bad. So the compass is established within this film to not point north. That's point number one for this counter argument. Point number two is that the compass is still on Jack's person at all times. Why does he consider this a valuable enough item to keep? Most would toss a useless trinket aside, if it was just a piece of garbage like that. The fact that Jack sees worth in it shows there's something more to it. Point number three is that Jack still uses it as a navigational tool to locate Isla de Muerta. It is an island that cannot be found without already knowing the location of it at the very least. So while in a storm where most other forms of navigation are impossible, the compass is weirdly useful for not being able to point north. How can we sail to an island that nobody can find? With a compass that doesn't work! Hi, the compass doesn't point north! But we're not trying to find north, are we? And at the very least, we know that Jack is successful in finding the island fast enough to save Elizabeth. My point is that the compass is always intended to be magical in some way, and the sequel's properly fleshed out how it works. This is how you make a franchise. And yes, they did have some form of plan all along. The fact that this film is called The Curse of the Black Pearl and not Pirates of the Caribbean shows that Disney wanted to make a franchise, which is 
publicly known, this is an established known fact, since they were trying to have a Lord of the Rings style massive blockbuster franchise of their own. And he runs into Turner, who tries to stop his escape. Excellent form, but how's your footwork? If I step here, very good. So I'm not gonna pretend the writing in this is spectacular. It is more clever than I think people give credit for. While it is at times a little exposition-y. You've seen a ship with black sail that's crewed by the devil. Who makes all these? I do, and I practice with them three hours a day. I've been practicing on ships and settlements for near 10 years. Adversary demands parlay, you can do them no harm blah, until blah, the parlay is blah. complete. There's a lot of information crammed into certain moments you might miss upon first viewing. Sparrow testing Turner's footwork is not only an excuse to have an action sequence, but it's also used to show how clever he is moving him closer towards the exit. Well, for one thing, yes, it is actually brilliant. And for another, exposition is not bad at all, actually. What's wrong with exposition? Exposition is required for storytelling to some degree. Learn how writing works, you fucking amoeba. And yeah, most scenes in these goddamn films do multiple things at once. Pay attention! Sparrow is captured, though, as the film tries to remind you, oh yeah, this was based on a riot, right? The dog is never going to move. Excuse us if we haven't resigned ourselves to the gallows just yet. First time. Pop culture reference. Followed by a random space of no audio or visuals. Learn how to edit. Sparrow's former ship, the Black Pearl, arrives as the golden piece Elizabeth had called to them in the water. Okay, this is gonna sound like an odd comparison, but these pirates kind of remind me of the nuns from Sister Act. In that they really didn't have to give them that much personality, but you do appreciate that every single one feels unique. They could just cast it extras in these roles, but no, they went out of their way to cast character actors who really do leave an impression. I especially love this one guy who's obsessed with explosions. <laughs> His crazy love for them is like a mix between Art the Clown and that weird bomber from The Tick. Bad is good, baby! Down with government! Uh, okay. Relevant how? Like, yeah, they're fun characters, okay? Is this worth pausing the film to discuss? Also, seriously, what is this guy thinking answering the door? Candy cram. Oh, I think too happy. And yeah, the guy's a bit dumb to try and open the door while under siege. You could excuse it by saying the Swan Estate is located decently far from the town, or that he could be aware of the attack and is wanting to let people inside to hide, but I'd say it's a genuine issue in all honesty. Congrats, you found a flaw. Good job, you wanna be critic. Wait, how's he know it's hot if later they say they can't feel anything? Holy shit, another good point. Doug, you're on a roll today. In fact, how'd this guy get her king knocked with that pan? Holy shit, a third one in a row? I'm so proud of you, Douglas. Darn, movie sucks now. I thought it was good until it was bad. And one lame-ass joke was able to ruin the magic. You gave me false hope of you being a decent critic. Oh well, back to the bullshit. Just to remind us, Sparrow doesn't get all the laughs. Yeah, I get a chuckle out of this scene every time I watch it. No need to mock a fine moment. We know you're here, Puppet. We will find you, Puppet. Come on out, we're gonna play ninja. Hey, then, hey! Hello, Poppy. Parley! They find Elizabeth, but she invokes the right of parlay, which means she can be taken to Captain Barbosa, played by Jeffrey Rush. And just like every role he's in, it looks like he's having a blast. I am here to negotiate the cessation of hostilities against Port Royal. A lot of long words in there, miss. We're not but humble pirates. Okay, so here's the thing about Will and Elizabeth in this. They are necessary characters to anchor credibility to all the goofiness going on. And in comparing the two, Elizabeth really isn't that bad. She clearly isn't trained as a fighter, so she has to use her wits to survive, and she is good at it. That bit of shine matters to us. Well, I suppose if it is worthless. No. She has enough charm and intelligence that I don't want to see anything bad happen to her. <sighs> Doug... I'd be very concerned if you wanted to see harm come to a young woman. Will, on the other hand, is so goddamn boring. All right, so this is where we get to the single point in the video that derailed the entire series. Criticizing Will and Elizabeth for being boring. Remember what I said in my intro about something in a film being boring? Boring is subjective. Not a point of criticism, but rather a personal preference. I personally find Will to be very interesting, with his arc of being a well-meaning young man who wants to break free from the societal expectations for his class of living, to accept who he really is deep down in embracing his roots of piracy, and becoming the single most powerful pirate on Earth in fulfilling the sacred duties tasked of him by Calypso. 
is perfectly fine to not be interested in his character. But sometimes, some people just like different things. If you personally find Will boring, that is entirely valid. You can have that opinion. There's nothing wrong with finding Will boring. That being said, if you use the word boring in an objective discussion of criticism, you're a fucking moron. How does your own personal enjoyment of a film have any bearing on quality? How is this a problem? Will works as a character. End of discussion. He functions well within the narrative, as Dumbass here explains, but critiquing something on the basis of being boring is disingenuous as fuck. They've taken Elizabeth. We have to hunt them down. We must save her. And where do you propose we start? The water! Uh, okay? A lot of this may come from Bloom wanted to play the role smooth and cool while Verbinski kept insisting he was supposed to be a dork. It's only sword fighting that he's supposed to excel at. Everything else about him is supposed to be out of place. And he's both too suave and too bland to be out of place. I of us! <laughs> yeah, is that really that funny? I feel like a Nicholas Holt, Tom Holland, or James McAvoy could pull this off with more comedy and personality. Bloom just looks like Legolas needs a bath. He doesn't leave much of an impact. But he is a dork. That's the point. He was never suave. He's played by a conventionally attractive actor. So if you're a moron, you can consider that suave, but I consider that just having good genes. Nothing with this character says suave, but rather naive, friendly, honorable, courageous, and a bit silly at times. He's way out of his element. That's the point. He has no idea what he's doing, but he has the base level skills of the era that would allow him to be a cut above the average Joe. Also, Tom Holland? Holland was a kid when this film came out, genius. With that said, though, he's not awful. Yes, he's not awful. He's a damn great character. Also, what the fuck is wrong with your face? He has a cute moment here and there, and clearly he's supposed to be eye candy for younger viewers. But whenever there's a scene where he's the focus, I constantly have to remind myself, oh, this scene was in the movie? I totally forgot that, despite seeing this several times. Okay, so you forgot some scenes in the film. That is on you for not paying attention. Not on Orlando Bloom for not playing a character the way you wanted them to be played. He was given a character and played the character according to how the director wanted. Ergo, regardless of your own personal feelings, he's a well-acted character. He did his job. You were familiar with that ship, the Black Pearl? I've heard of it. Thankfully, he teams up with Jack Sparrow, though, who agrees to help him save Elizabeth if he can help him escape and be captain once again of the Black Pearl. I feel like there's a lot of reasons that wouldn't work, but... Repeat to yourself, it's just a park attraction that's been turned into a movie. I should really just relax. Yes. This is a flaw. I find it weird how you say this should be ignored, but later on you point out flaws that are not actually flaws to begin with. So which is it, Doug? Ignore the problems because it's a kid's theme park ride movie, or we should make up flaws and call these films bad. I'm in the camp of calling out flaws when I see them, and being honest about the criticism, instead of being a pathological liar and a disingenuous cunt like you. They take command of a ship and Norrington chases after them. Search every cabin, every hole, down to the building. Be sure to bring every last man on board. All eggs in this basket. It's Dark Knight Rises rules here. Yes, this is a flaw. Congrats. You just said before that we should ignore these things because it's based on a theme park ride. So should you have taken your own advice and not brought this up? So congrats. You made a good point while also contradicting yourself. Of course, Jack and Will take over the other ship and sail off with it, having destroyed the ship they left over as cannons and rudder. That's got to be the best part I've ever seen. So it would seem. Well, maybe it's just because you suck balls. He's the greatest pirate we've ever seen. Will finds out that his father named Bootstrap Bill was indeed a pirate, much to his letdown. Good man. Good pirate. I swear you look just like him. Yes, they're practically identical. Again, all planned from the beginning. Yes, Bootstrap looks a lot like an older Will. The actors had somewhat similar faces at the time. They travel to pick up his friend Gibbs as well as a crew at a place that seems to love and hate him at the same time. Not sure I deserve that. Seems like the Depp heard trial in a nutshell. <laughs> Meanwhile, Elizabeth lies about her last name, saying it's Turner. So they don't know she's the governor's daughter, but rather they're under the impression that she's Bootstrap Bill's child. There's no need to stand on ceremony. You must be hungry. Jesus, you pig! This is Aztec gold. A terrible curse. Why is it every moment he's on screen I want him to sing, I'm reviewing the situation? No! 
Wow, he actually said, Arr. I'm not sure why I assumed this movie wouldn't have him do that, but it's strange to see for some reason. Yeah, it's a pirate film. Arr. It wasn't even prompted. Could he have at least been like, sorry, it's talk like a pirate day. We needed a break from our usual talk like a board office worker ritual. though he's working with a skeleton crew who can't die or feel anything because they're cursed. But returning the gold they stole along with her blood will lift it. Working with? No, they work for him. He's the captain. This film establishes that they follow his orders. Pay attention. You best start believing in ghost stories, Miss Turner. You're in one. And spoilers, we do make random sounds so that ghost hunters can go, what was that? And here comes the commercial break, because you gotta pay the bill somehow. Too bad the ad break is four minutes long. I could do a faster ad break. If you want to support my channel, consider donating to my Patreon. Patrons get some neat perks, including video shoutouts, special roles on my Discord server, and even direct commissions for video ideas. Link in the description and in the pinned comment for that. Also, check out my Discord server. It's an active community with over 300 members, and we would love to have you guys aboard. Also, I have a merch store through Teespring, where you can buy mugs and t-shirts. A link will also be in the description for that, and all links will also be in the pinned comment below. Jack and Will acquire themselves a crew, including... Zoe Zeldana? Uh, yeah, Zoe Zeldana is an actress who works in the film industry. She has been in many films, including this one. You stole my boat! You'll get another one! I will. I don't need this, I have like five green screens to be in front of tomorrow! Also, the examples he pulled up for her being in front of green screens are terrible ones. For starters, she's on physical sets for most of these. And with Avatar, the film is partially animated. But yeah, make fun of green screens while also having some of the most laughable green screens for a professional production company yourself. She also has more success in her career than you could ever hope to achieve. So stay in your lane, dumbass. The ship sets sail and Gibbs tells Turner about how Jack had his ship taken away by Barbosa and marooned him on a desert island. But not before he'd gone mad with the heat. So that's the reason for all that. That's a great impression of everybody's impression of him. Ooh, self burn. Those are rare. They get to the treasure where they return the coin along with Elizabeth's blood, but they don't know if it worked. How do we tell? Do I need a joke for everything? Can't that just be funny? Yes, you can just let the joke be funny. You could have cut half of your terrible attempts at humor and spared me the patience with your bullshit. Good job leaving yourself open for that by basically lampshading how shitty your writing is. Parlay! Damn to the depths whatever might have thought of Parlay! That would be the French. Ah, the French. Will and Elizabeth escape, but Jack gets captured and he tells him why Elizabeth's blood didn't work. Kill him. The girl's blood didn't work, did it? Hold your fire! Despite only having a few scenes together, I instantly believe the rivalry between these two. Yeah, no, they're fantastic actors. Not much to add. I, I agree with you, Doug. Jack tells him where to locate the ship, but Elizabeth has a plan of attack. No, the anchor on the right side. On the starboard side! Sammy has the element of surprise. Cannons are fired, eyes are forked up, and Jack escapes just to get captured again. Yeah, he's basically the hot solo of this series, a smuggler who always has to be saved even in between movies. Okay. How's that plan working out, Elizabeth? You definitely got some brains, but a pirate's life ain't for you. Oh, I mean, it's what we were always building up the whole time! Or, maybe, just maybe, they're fighting enemies that cannot be killed. No shit they were out of luck. They're being chased by a ship that's faster than theirs, with a crew that can't be killed. What, do you think they really had any options? Also, what's wrong with Elizabeth becoming the Pirate King? Nobody starts off perfect at everything, and we all know how bad a story can be, if they're just good at everything from the get-go. You know, all the bad stuff really is in the sequels, isn't it? And no, the bad stuff is just in the fourth and fifth films. You're a moron. We will rip into this soon enough, trust me. Okay. It's a win. For some reason, I don't think monkeys are funny, but people saying the word monkey is goddamn.
You took a funny line and ruined it. You took advantage of our hospitality last time. Now you return the favor. <laughs> so what, do you think pirates respected consent laws? She goes free! Wheel says his blood is what they need to lift the curse and forces them to let Elizabeth and Jack go. They do so, but abandon them on the same island Jack was marooned before. I'd be having that dress back before you go. <laughs> goes with your black heart. It's purple. Yes, black and purple look great together. Your point? That be the same little island that we made you governor of on our last little trip. Perhaps you'll be able to conjure up another miraculous escape. Yeah, why are you putting him back in the place he got out of again? What, you think this island has a Boeing 737 Max and a runway? He's just gonna get off the island by flying away? Or he operates off the cartoon logic that he pulled out some wood and nails and built a bridge off the island? Or he could just run across? What kind of moron would assume that he could just pull the most insanely lucky escape imaginable twice? Sings about as well as he did in Sweeney Todd. Jack has yet another way to weasel his way into an opportunity, though. Think about it. The Black Pearl. You will accompany these fine men to the helm and provide us with a bearing to Ila de Muerta. Why do people keep listening to him? Because he's the only person who knows where the island is. Who the fuck else would be able to help? Jack, it's not possible. How did you escape from the place you escaped before? We were so careful to do the same thing! Like I just said, he has no reason to assume that Jack would pull off an impossible escape again. This is like seeing somebody get in a car accident that should have killed them, seeing them survive, and thinking they're immune to car accidents. Jack tells him about Norrington's ship outside and once again gets in their good graces. This is of course a quintuple cross as Jack frees Will while the other pirates attack the ship. And as fun as the sword fighting is, I will admit, my favorite stuff is just Jonathan Price fighting this evil dead hand. It's such a weird thing to keep cutting back to during this big battle, and I love it. Yeah, I agree. It is fun. I honestly don't have many notes about this climax. Fighting in and out of the moonlight is cool. This weird thing where they put a bomb in a guy's stomach is cool. You like pain? <gasps> Try wearing a corset. That line's a little lame, but overall the finale's pretty fun. Yeah, you're finally becoming base. This final battle's pretty awesome. Jack uses the bullet he's been saving for years to kill Barbosa just as Turner returns the coin with his blood. I feel... cold. Okay, so this is admittedly a weird complaint, but for years I always thought he said, I feel old, when really he said, I feel cold. I think I feel old is a better line. Feel old? What? Why is that better? Yeah, I feel old too. I remember when your content was actually relevant. Your reasoning is that he would get his feeling back and he would feel aging as he died, which is the exact same purpose behind the line of I feel cold. The cold version is better anyways. He had not felt the warmth of a woman's flesh and had finally found the opportunity to feel again, but all he felt was the cold embrace of death. It's almost a tragic line. He spent so many years trying to feel again, only to have one feeling, that of vanishing into the afterlife. Dark as shit. Almost tragic. Go watch my video on the subject. The pirates go back to normal and Verbinski on his commentary track said this is when you realize the movie was actually kind of about something. And it sounds weird, but I know what he's talking about. These pirates spent so long trying to get this curse lifted to stop being invincible, and now that's gone, everything else they know is about to be taken away. No words, no hammered in symbolism, just a good quiet moment that lets it all sink in. It's a solid scene. Yeah, it really is a great scene. One of my favorites, in fact. Once again, though, Jack is captured and about to be executed, but fear not, Will helps him escape with... a rope! Really don't think it's gonna do much. Yeah, this is fair criticism. Though I would argue that it keeps consistent with the soldiers' already admittedly poor tactics. Dumb, but not worth bringing up this late into the film. Did any guard train for anything in this? Is someone gonna be like, look, salt? But it's cool. Elizabeth says she loves Will and not Norrington, so that convinces him to let Jack go. What? You lying cunt. The reason they lower their weapons is because Elizabeth stood by Will and Jack in front of their guns. Weatherby demanded them to lower their weapons. You lying motherfucker! You forget your place, Turner. It's right here. Between you and Jack. 
Those is mine. This man. Lower your weapons. For goodness sake, put them down. Elizabeth, it would never have worked between us, darling. Ah, what a silly idea. We tease for two more movies. Yes, they do tease that quite a bit in the second film and not at all in the third film. That's because for all she knows, Will could be out of the picture in her life and Jack is being kind to her in her depression. There's nothing wrong with this. Drink up, me hearty Joe-ho. And that was Pirates of the Caribbean, The Curse of the Black Pearl. Not perfect, but a damn good time. This is the definition of a turn your brain off movie. No, because if you turn your brain off, you get bullshit criticism like yours. It's a good start to a good... It's a good start. A great start to a great trilogy. And two more films that make me want to cave my skull in with a pressure chamber. Skipping the unfunny skit, this video is an unmitigated disaster of bad faith criticisms, bringing up unimportant shit for the sake of it, sloppy joke material, inconsistent logic, conflation of opinions in fact, and worst of all, actively lying to the audience. Jesus fucking Christ, this guy is an awful critic. But he only gets worse. Stay tuned!